You know, one of the embarrassing things that can happen in life is when we forget somebody's name, right? That is, that is rather embarrassing, especially when they make eye contact with you. You know, you, you see them across a room or whatever the, the uh, circumstances may be, and, uh, and then, you, you know, you have that sort of, you know, fright in your mind. You know, like, what is this person's name, right? And then, and it's even worse than when they see you and you can tell they're looking forward to saying hi to you. And here they come across the room to say hi. And now you're going to be stuck because you don't know their name. And so then, you know, if you're like me, you start to, you know, go through in your mind, you know, what are, what are things that would help me to remember this person's name? Oh, they have blonde hair. Is their name Barbie? Is their name Ken? I don't know. They're kind of tall. They're kind of short. You know, you, you try to do all those association things to try and help you remember. And if you're like me, it doesn't work that well often. So if you had been at first service this morning, you would have been in worship with my wife, Kathy. And my wife, Kathy, and I, we have a, a little thing figured out to help me in this situation. Because guys, can I be honest? You have it very easy. Can I just say that? Because all you have to do is look and see that little plastic thing I've got in my collar of my shirt. And you say, oh, he is a, a pastor. And all I have to remember is to say, hello, pastor. That's right. I don't get that. I have to remember your names. I have to remember your names. And so uh, when my wife is with me, which is wonderful, we have this little thing worked out. I'm going to share it with you. You'll see it, uh, me using it in the future probably at some point. When somebody is coming to me whose name I don't remember, you'll see me sort of slip my hand down and grab a hold of my wife's hand and give it a little pump. And that's her cue. Kathy just steps right up, sticks out her hand and says, hello, my name is Kathy Buckman. And now that person has to do what? Hi, I'm Billy Bob or whoever it is. And I say, hello, Bob, good to meet you. Great to see you again. The problem in the text for today is not that the disciples don't remember Jesus' name. The problem in the text for today is that they don't recognize Jesus' identity. They don't recognize that Jesus is truly God in human form. And you know, we see this problem again and again. Just last week, in the feeding of the 5,000, we saw that problem. And it's contrasted, the attitude, the, the lack of belief, if I can just be blunt about it, on the part of the disciples, is contrasted with the belief and the rejoicing of the crowds. What an amazing thing when you stop and think about it, because these disciples, they had the uh, amazing experience of walking with the Son of God. And yet in last week's reading and again in this week's reading, we see that it is these disciples who are physically the closest to Jesus are spiritually in some ways the most distant. Because did you catch at the end of the reading for today that just like in the reading for last week, the crowds recognize Jesus they go and tell everybody Jesus is here, and not just his name, but they recognize that he is God in human form. And this is evident by the fact that they bring everybody who needs a miracle to him. They recognize Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you and I are honest, we will have to admit that we are like the disciples at times, that we do not recognize Jesus we do not give him credit for who he is. We do not respect that he is God in human form and that he can do in our lives what he has always done. And not only don't we recognize him, but we don't confess him as being such with others. And so this is a very important topic that we're going to talk about today. And there's a great twist to the text that I can't wait to share with you. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy. Father, we thank you 
that when we had no idea who Jesus was, that when we had no relationship with you through the Son, that you revealed yourself and your grace and your mercy to us, and that you do so patiently over and over again, just like Jesus did with these disciples. Help us to be comforted by this, Father. Help us to be encouraged by this, Father. And help us, Father, also to have our focus turned to our neighbor, to look to those who are around us, and to ask how might we serve them, to help them recognize that Jesus is in their presence as well. And that Jesus seeks to bless them both here and for eternity. Father, speak to us today by the power of your word through the work of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. Amen. Guys, I want to start with Mark chapter 6, verses 47 to 49. And it says, And when evening came, the boat, this is the boat with the disciples, the boat was out on the sea. Jesus was alone on the land. Jesus saw that they were making, that's the disciples, the disciples were making headway, that is, across the lake, painfully. Why? Because the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. Our sermon is titled, What Do You Do When You Don't Recognize Someone? I think it's interesting and important to note, first of all, that in the gospel reading for today, we see that Mark references Roman time. He says it's the fourth watch of the night. That's not the Jewish way of keeping time in the day of Jesus. In the day of Jesus, the Jewish way of keeping time divided the night up into three parts. Mark doesn't use the Jewish way of keeping time. Mark uses the Roman way of keeping time. And I think it's kind of interesting as a, as a history major in undergrad. I think it's kind of interesting because that tells you something about the audience of Mark's gospel. That the audience of Mark's gospel would have largely been Gentile, or at least certainly largely familiar with the Roman way of keeping time. But I think there's something much more important going on here than just this little historical footnote. And that is this, that the fourth watch of the night is from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And so what that tells us is that the disciples had been in this boat trying to get across this lake, which they were very familiar with, for at least six hours. They had been struggling, and they had been doing everything that they knew. They, they had been working together, all 12 of them, and um, they, 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 they tried everything they could, but yet, despite all of their best efforts, they had made really no progress. And so here we see something very instructive in the Christian faith, and that is this, don't miss this, that we left to our own efforts, despite our very best efforts, despite all that we would do, despite following all the advice that our parents have ever given us, in our attempt to grow closer to God in heaven, left to our own devices, left to our own means, our own abilities, we will make no progress. But the good news is that Jesus observes. And he doesn't just observe, he then goes to where we are and pay special attention to how Jesus gets to where we are because Jesus gets to where we are by doing a miracle involving water. He literally walked on water to get out to where the disciples were and that is how Jesus gets to where we are today through a miracle involving water. And that miracle involving water we call the sacrament of, of baptism. That's exactly right. Can we give God a praise clap for that this morning? 
Absolutely. Listen to these words again from verse 48. It says they were making headway painfully. So they were doing everything they knew. The wind was against them. It was the fourth watch of the night when he came to them. But now what does Jesus do when he comes to them? Did you catch that in the text? Here comes the twist that I promised you. It says in the text that he came to them that he might pass them by. What? The disciples are out there on this lake, struggling for hour after hour after hour, making no headway. Jesus sees the difficulty that they're in. He does this miracle of walking on the water. To what purpose? That he might pass them by? What is that all about? So, so Jesus is going to walk on the water out to where these guys are, and he's going to, he's going to do what? Say, horrible to be you, and just pass them by? If Jesus would do that with his disciples, well, maybe that's what Jesus has been doing with me. Gosh, I mean, I've been struggling with this thing in my life, my employment situation, my educational advancement, my relationship, my parents' medical condition. I've been struggling with this thing in my life for more than just six hours, for weeks or months or years. And is that what Jesus has been doing with me? Looking and seeing all that I'm doing to try to get out of this situation? And then here comes Jesus just to pass me by? What is this all about? Is that how Jesus works? Does he just look at you and your difficulty and pass you by? No, he doesn't. Here's the twist in the text that I want to share with you, I want to unpack for you, because there's a tremendous blessing in this. And once you get this blessing, you're going to be able to be a blessing to many more people. When the Bible says that God passed people by, what that means is that God actually drew near to them. And why did God draw near to them? That he might deliver them from their circumstances. I want to take you back to the Old Testament. I want to take you to Moses, and I want to take you to Elijah. Because we're going to see God passing them by in Scripture. And it's so powerful when that happens. When God passes Moses by, we're going to, I'm going to read it for you here in just a little bit. I'm going to set the context for you. Moses has just led the people of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea, and they've crossed over into the desert, and they're going to start their journey to the promised land. And it's at the beginning of this process that then God calls Moses up onto Mount Sinai where he he's going to reveal to Moses that he's going to pass him by. Listen to these words from Exodus 13, 18 and 22. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And Yahweh, God, said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock, when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I want to draw your attention to the prophet Elijah. I'll set the context for you briefly with the prophet Elijah. The prophet Elijah had a very challenging ministry. During his ministry, the king of Israel at that time, his name was Ahab, and all you have to do is to read but this one verse from chapter 16, which describes King Ahab in this way, that King Ahab had done more that was wicked in the sight of God than all the kings who had preceded him. Not only was King Ahab wicked, but he had married a wicked woman, and her name was Jezebel. And so it was 
in this context that Elijah had to minister. And so his message from God to the people of Israel was turn away from the false prophets. Turn to the one true living God. And so one of the first things that God had Elijah prophesy to the people of Israel was that there would be no more rainfall in the land. And so when that happened, then Elijah crossed over the Jordan River. He went east of the Jordan River to a brook called the Kirith. And he waited there at that brook. And you might remember that's when the ravens came and, and fed Elijah. And Elijah remained there until due to the drought, the brook dried up. And then God led Elijah to go to Zarephath. And there was a widow there in Zarephath. So first it's ravens, and now it's a widow that's, that God's going to use to provide for Elijah. And this widow at Zarephath, you remember the story, she feeds Elijah, she takes care of Elijah, but then her son tragically dies. And so she asked the prophet to bring her son back to life. In fact, she feels guilty that her sin has caused his death, her son's death. And so you remember the story, Elijah spreads himself out over the son three times and prays, and God miraculously restores her son to life. And then Elijah is then called to go and speak to Ahab directly. And, and, he, and he confronts Ahab directly with what is uh, going wrong in the nation of Israel. And then that's where on Mount Carmel that, that incredible scene happens where 450 of these false prophets are lined up against Elijah. Next time you think you're having a rough day at the office, just remember Elijah. 450 false prophets lined up against him. And you remember how it goes? Then Elijah calls down fire from heaven and, and, and the offering is consumed. And then Elijah kills those 450 false prophets. Ahab tells his wife Jezebel, and she was a mean, wicked woman. And Jezebel responds by saying to Elijah, it will be so unto you as it was to these prophets. And Elijah is scared. And so Elijah flees from that place, and he flees out to this mountain called Horeb, which is also known as the Mount of God. And it's there that then God comes to Elijah, and he says these words. Listen to 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah, and said to him, now listen to this question that God is going to put to Elijah, because God's going to ask Elijah the exact same question at the end of the conversation. God says to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, don't you remember how I've taken care of you? Don't you remember all the amazing miracles I've done? What are you do Why are you letting this woman scare you like this? What are you doing here, Elijah? God said, Go and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to Elijah and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, get up. Be of good confidence. Be of good cheer. For the one true living God of Israel is with you. And so this is what Jesus is doing here in the gospel text for today. It says that he was going to pass them by. What does that mean? It doesn't mean he was going to walk by and say, oh, you guys sure are having a rough time of it. See you on the other side. No, it means he has come to deliver them and to comfort them and to encourage them to reveal himself, to be as God in human form to them. And so to add insult to injury... When the disciples who are in this boat see Jesus drawing close unto them, what is their response? They don't say, oh, Jesus, it's so good to see you. Oh, thank goodness you're finally here. No, to add insult to injury, 
They thought it wasn't Jesus, but a what? A ghost. That's exactly right. When Scripture tells us Jesus passed by, it's not giving us an update on his itinerary. It's talking to us about his divinity. So in John chapter 1, when Jesus is going to be baptized, we read these words. When John the Baptist saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the very Lamb of God. And in Luke 18, we read about the blind man who was there the day that Jesus passed by. And we hear his response. It says this in Luke 18, 37 and 38. Now hearing a crowd going by, the blind man began to inquire, what is this? What is this noise? They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And the blind man called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. In both cases, there is a recognition and a confession of Christ's divinity following his passing by. But I have to tell you what speaks to my heart the greatest in this account for today is the actions of Jesus in spite of knowing what the actions of his disciples were going to be. Because if you stop and think about it, Jesus already knew, before he even took one step out onto that lake, Jesus already knew that when he came to pass by his disciples, when he came to bring God into their presence, He already knew that they weren't going to recognize him and they weren't going to get it because they were hard-hearted still. But this is the love of your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ, to those disciples and to you today. That you have a Savior who looks upon you and sees a follower who doesn't always get it, who is hard-hearted at times who doubts and denies and despairs. But you have a Savior who loves you perfectly and completely. And even knowing that you're not going to get it a whole lot of the time, he still steps out onto the lake of your life and into the storms that you got yourself into most of the time to bring the love of God to you. Can we give God a praise clap for that this morning? Amen. Today, in just a little bit, Jesus is going to pass us by. How is that? Where will that be? How will that happen? In the Lord's Supper. Because in the Lord's Supper, we will receive his body and his blood. We will receive this for the forgiveness of sins and the fruitfulness of sanctification. That's why these words are recorded for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let a person examine himself. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning, without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment upon themselves. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus' disciples could make no sense of him that day because they could not discern that he was God in human form. But come on, we have the benefit of the hindsight of 2,000 years. Let's not make that mistake today. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have a wonderful mission statement as a church that we're going to glorify God by spreading the gospel. And then we're going to do this by focusing on three things. We're going to focus on our preaching, on our teaching, and on living our daily lives. That's exactly right. And that's where we're going to wrap up. As we wrap up, I want to ask you to consider this one thought. I want to ask you to consider the context that Moses was in when God passed him by. The challenges that he faced when God drew near to him to show him that he was with him. I want to ask you to consider the context of Elijah 
when God passed him by, when God drew near to him to deliver him and to comfort him and to encourage him in his situation, I want to ask you to consider the context of the blind man and his life and what that was like when Jesus passed him by. And here's what I really want to ask you to consider in closing today. As you walk out of here today, I want to ask you to in your prayer time this week to ask God for wisdom and direction and guidance. Because in each of your lives, there is somebody who feels like they are going through a storm in life. A storm in which they have been struggling and they have tried everything that they know how to do. And they feel like they're all alone. That they're not worthy and that God doesn't care. And brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to encourage you to consider this. That you would be the person that God would use in their life. To help them to recognize that Jesus is passing them by that Jesus is drawing near unto them because he cares about them and he wants to deliver them from their circumstances both for time and for eternity. Because in each of our lives, there are people who are facing these obstacles and God desires for each of us to have that peace which surpasses all human understanding, that peace that is found only in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's go in this peace. Let's serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.